The year 1921 signifies an important transition in the evolution of the Baha'i faith. This was the year that Abdul Baha left this earthly plane. Friends, the time is coming that I shall be no longer with you. I have done all that could be done. I have served the cause of Baha'u'llah to the utmost of my ability. I have labored night and day all the years of my life. Oh, how I long to see the friends shouldering the responsibilities of the cause. Remember, whether or not I be on earth, my presence will be with you always. But who was this man that was loved and respected by so many, by rich and poor, Muslim and Christian, by the highest and lowest in society? What was it like to be in his presence? The famous Orientalist Edward Granville Brown, who met him in 1890, so described him. Seldom have I seen one whose appearance impressed me more. A tall, strongly built man, holding himself straight as an arrow, with white turban and raiment, long black locks reaching almost to the shoulder combined with an unswerving will, eyes keen as a hawk's, and strongly marked but pleasant features. Such was my first impression of Abbas Effendi, the master. What kind of popularity was it that would cause, within a day of his passing, and in an age of limited communication, more than 10,000 to gather and mourn the one they knew as Abbas Effendi. Palestine had never seen such an outpouring of grief. The master was a father to the poor and a physician to the sick, an example and counsellor to the high and mighty, and a loving brother to all who crossed his path. He was so loved, so admired, with quality so extraordinary, that his own father, Baha'u'llah, considered him a marvel and titled him Serullah, the mystery of God. But he himself insisted on simply being known as Abdul Baha, the servant of Baha. His spiritual sensitivity, profound humility and utter consecration for others were legendary. His own sister and mother often said that if you are not watchful, he would give everything we possess away to others in need. On one such occasion, he tried to give away the rug under their feet, at which point his sister intervened, saying, If you give this remaining rug away, you will have to give me away too. Abdul Baha, whose given name was Abbas, was born on May the 23rd, 1844 into an illustrious family in the city of Tehran in Persia, now Iran. On the very eve of his birth, miles away in the southern city of Shiraz, a young merchant named Ali Muhammad declared that he, the Bab, was the promised one whose return the Muslims had been expecting for some 1,300 years. The Bab's message heralding the day of him whom God shall make manifest struck a chord with people in Persia and attracted a broad spectrum of society to his faith. It also provoked opposition, leading to the persecution and death of tens of thousands of his followers and culminating in the Bab's own martyrdom in 1850. At this time, Abdu'l-Bahá was six years old. His mother's name was Asiya Khanum, and his father, who in later years would become known as Baha'u'llah, the glory of God, was called Mirza Hussein Ali. Abbas had been named after his grandfather, Mirza Bozorg Nuri, a vizier in the court of the monarch Fat Ali Shah. His childhood had been privileged, and he had grown up in a beautiful mansion surrounded by gardens and orchards. His parents mindful of their responsibilities, shared their wealth with the poor 
and needy, and Mirza Hossein Ali was widely known as the father of the poor. But all that was to change within a few short years. It was during those early years of his life and the Babi faith that the poet and heroine Tahere was a guest under the roof of Baha'u'llah. He himself describes how she held him as a little boy on her lap and conversed with him. It was also during those early years that the historian Nabil Zarandi recounts how the little Abbas took his hand and accompanied him around his family home, showing him all the rooms. During the hot days of summer, he sometimes slept outside in his grandfather's garden and rode horses with his father in the cool, lush mountains. One day, before he was eight, Abbas went to visit shepherds who tended his father's sheep. They invited Abbas to share their meal. After they had eaten, the head shepherd told Abbas that it was the custom for a guest to leave a present for the shepherds. He thought for a while and then gave away all the sheep to them. When Baha'u'llah heard the news, he laughed and said that his son needed someone to watch over him, otherwise he might give himself away. The sibling closest to him was Bahiye, his younger sister by three years. In 1903, she provided a full account of their time spent together. In August 1852, an attempt was made on the life of the Shah. The failed assassination by a deranged Barbi youth caused an uproar in the city. All the followers of the Bab were targeted for reprisals, and the house of Baha'u'llah was sacked and looted. There we gathered together some furniture, which had been left by the mob, and lived in one room destitute of all but the barest necessities. Baha'u'llah, who took the brunt of the blame, was forced to walk from Neyavaran to Tehran, a distance of 15 miles. In the burning heat of a summer day, bareheaded, barefooted and in chains, with crowds hurling stones and insults at him along the way. Together with 80 other Barbies, Baha'u'llah was thrown into the infamous Siachal, the Black Pit of Tehran, with a chain around his neck infamous for its galling weight. The little boy had a deep longing to see his father. With the help of a friendly guard, he was carried into this dungeon on the shoulders of a servant. Down they went, down and still further down two flights of steps until they reached a long pitch black corridor. The prison was a disused water system under the palace. The air was fetid, foul with stench, the darkness pitch. Some 150 souls, including thieves and assassins, were crowded in that hole. As Abdul Bahar explained at the very bottom, when he could see nothing, we heard his blessed voice, do not bring him here, and so we returned. Baha'u'llah, expecting imminent execution as leader of the Barbies, was instead reserved for the more horrible suffering of witnessing the successive torture and death of his companions one after the other. To keep up their spirits, Baha'u'llah had his companions chant a refrain antiphonally throughout the night, one group singing, God is sufficient unto me, he is the all-sufficing, and the other responding with, in him let the trusting trust. 140 years later, at the 1992 Baha'i World Congress in New York, some 30,000 participants heard that same chant re-echoing on the other side of the planet.
Four months passed in this state of fearful agony. Four months during which the government investigated Baha'u'llah's connection with the attack on the life of the Shah, and the family lived in suspense and terror. According to Bahia Khanum, one day, in the course of these months, we found Abbas Effendi surrounded by a band of boys who had undertaken to personally molest him. He was standing in their midst, firmly but quietly commanding them not to lay their hands upon him, which, strange to say, they seemed unable to do. And it was during these four months, here in this vermin-infested dungeon, with his neck bowed down by chains, that Baha'u'llah received the first intimation of his mission. In that pitch-black, fetid darkness, a maiden appeared before him, imparting tidings of his station, communicating his spiritual sovereignty, announcing God's message for this day. Following his release months later, Bahia Khanum commented, We saw a new radiance seeming to enfold him, like a shining vesture. Its significance we were to learn years later. Although the government's investigation found no connection between Baha'u'llah and the attack on the life of the Shah, it decided to exile him and his family to Baghdad under strict military escort. The season was bitterly cold and the route lay over mountains. The convoy moved with painful slowness, covering only several miles a day, so that the journey lasted three months. Baha'u'llah was very ill and weak. The chains had left his neck galled, raw and swollen. As Bahia Khanum later recalled, we were all insufficiently clothed and suffered keenly from exposure. My brother in particular was very thinly clad, riding upon a horse, his feet, ankles, hands and wrists, much exposed to the cold, became frostbitten and swollen. The effects of this experience he feels to this day on being chilled or having a cold. We arrived in Baghdad in a state of great misery, Bahia Khanum later recorded, and also of almost utter destitution. During these early years, Abbas Effendi had recognized the glory of his father's station and did everything possible to serve him. He also frequented the mosques and coffee houses at that time and debated with the doctors and learned men he met there. They were astonished at his knowledge and acumen. He came to be known among them as the youthful sage. They would ask him, who is your teacher? Where do you learn the things which you say? His reply was that his father had taught him. Although he had never been to school, he was as proficient in all that was taught and more knowledgeable as a youth than most well-educated men. Those who knew him would often remark on his beauty, as his sister recalls. In appearance, my brother was at this time a remarkably fine-looking youth. During the years in Baghdad, Baha'u'llah's fame continued to grow, with streams of visitors from Iraq and further afield seeking his presence. His fame spread so far that the Persian authorities, aided by Baha'u'llah's jealous half-brother Mirza Yahya, brought pressure on the Ottoman Sultan for a further exile to Constantinople, present-day Istanbul. Twelve days prior to his departure, in a garden he called Rezvan, or Paradise, amongst the roses and nightingales across the river Tigris, Baha'u'llah declared himself to be the one foretold by the Bab, the one whom God shall make manifest, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. That day, the 21st of April, 1863, is celebrated annually by Baha'is worldwide as Rezvan, the most important festival of their faith. After a 12-day sojourn in the Garden of Rizvan on the 2nd of May, 1863, 
Baha'u'llah's second banishment began a decade after his exile from Persia. Abdul Baha, forewarned of his father's station, had immediately taken the role of special attendant, servant and bodyguard for him. During the journey to Constantinople, he watched over him day and night, riding by his wagon and guarding close by his tent when he was resting. In order to get a little sleep himself, after first reassuring himself of his father's well-being, he adopted the plan of riding fast ahead of the caravan and then dismounting at a considerable distance away. He would then make his horse lie down and with his head on his horse's neck would sleep a little until the cavalcade reached them, at which point his horse would kick him and he would wake up and remount. Bahia Khanum described his routine. Every night he was the first to arrive at the campsite and arrange for food and water, then stayed up all night looking for further fresh supplies. They reached Constantinople by mid-August and Baha'u'llah was received with much deference and respect. But by December, only four months later, a further exile took place, instigated by his ill wishes. This time he was banished to the furthermost corner of Turkey, to the city of Adrianople, modern-day Adirna. Here they spent a miserable winter surviving on bare necessities, and here too Abbas Effendi did his utmost to protect his father from Mirza Yahya. The machinations of Baha'u'llah's jealous half-brother had now taken a more somber turn. He was plotting against Baha'u'llah's life and finally poisoned his food. The attempt was almost fatal. Filled with grief, Abbas put his head on Baha'u'llah's pillow and begged him to live. Though his father could not speak, he laid his hand gently on Abbas's head. Baha'u'llah did recover, but his hand shook forever after because of the poison, and it affected his handwriting. During his time in Adrianople, Abbas Effendi mingled with men of all religious backgrounds and endeared himself to high and low alike. Even the governor became a friend and delighted to listen to his discourse. It was from this time that he began to be called the master. When the governor received the Sultan's order in 1868 of sending the exiles still further and banishing Baha'u'llah from Adrianople, Bahia Khanum writes that he was so affected by it that not having the heart to execute it himself, he put it into the hands of his subordinates, wrote a letter to Abbas Effendi and left the city. One day, unexpectedly, a cordon of soldiers surrounded the residence of Baha'u'llah. A bugle was sounded and Abbas Effendi was handed the governor's letter. Stunned by the edict which imposed banishment on the exiles to different places, he responded that we would rather die than be separated. The commanding officer retorted that they would all go that same day and would be forcibly parted. But Abbas Effendi demanded to see the representative of the governor. He insisted that a telegraph be sent to Constantinople, appealing for a common banishment at the very least. The reply was negative. But Abbas Effendi remained resolute. He refused to take no for an answer and continued to send more dispatches to the capital, eloquently pleading their case. The family was in turmoil. The master seemed to be making no headway. Would they have to be scattered and separated from their beloved Baha'u'llah? Finally, Abbas Effendi demanded the presence of the governor, who in the meanwhile had returned to the city. When he came and saw the state they were in, 
he communicated to Sultan Abdul Aziz himself. It is impossible, he wrote. We cannot separate these people. The next day, a reply came, granting permission for the entire family of Baha'u'llah and his followers to leave all together. But no one knew where they were to be sent. <laughs>